All right, why do I believe the carnivore diet is special? Hey guys, Dr. John Baker here. I just got back in from uh, two weeks in Europe. A uh, whole lot of breath. I just got done running sprints and doing some rowing sprints, just kind of ease my way back into uh, more normal workouts while I was there. It was mostly a lot of walking, some push-ups and stuff like that. So I didn't have access to a kind of a regular gym. So uh, weight was about unchanged. I think I left uh, there around two, 58 came back to 56 so no real change in weight i ate basically i stayed carnivore the whole time a lot more dairy products than i normally eat but uh anyway still uh you know my wife is from france and she is mostly carnivore in france she has her her baguettes and bread and i think every day she had some baguettes um she's back on her more regular carnivore diet as well personally i didn't i do you know i wasn't really tempted I, you know i've had french baguettes before they're fine but it wasn't anything that uh I felt a need to indulge in and I didn't so but anyway uh criticism on a carnivore diet you know they're 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 ubiquitous everybody's talking about it it's because it drives it lies clicks and views and something to talk about it. and the typical thing is well you know it's just a calorie deficit or you could do it on any diet and this is this is potentially dangerous long term and again the the, the so-called long-term dangers are really unknown no one really knows anybody says it you know based on our information about nutrition, surely this must be bad. It's complete gaslighting and BS. We have no long-term data. Uh, well, I would say no modern nutritional long-term data. We've got countless uh, you know, historical accounts of this and the whole perhaps evolution of human beings as, as sort of counter evidence there. But, you know, one of the things that I often see is, you know, well, let's just say that you go on a carnivore diet and at some point you die. That's, that's a pretty pretty reasonable scenario. I think we're all gonna die. And you're probably gonna die of heart disease or cancer. I mean, those are just the realities of, of, uh, of living today. I mean, and if you don't, then, then good on you, you know? But I mean, it's just like, to say that a carnivore diet is gonna make me more likely to develop heart disease or cancer versus the average person, I think probably is not true. Now, I don't know that for sure, because again, we do not have long-term randomized controlled trials on this diet or for that matter on any diet that would answer that question uh, truly so we just don't know that now why do i think a carnivore diet can be superior to many other diets versus just a calorie deficit just a eat a lot of protein eat a lot of fiber diet right well as we probably are very painfully aware here in the united states somewhere north of 70 percent of our population is either too friggin fat or obese right we've got a 70 percent overweight obese population that number is growing right all these epic shots in the world are not going to change that uh even if even if donald trump becomes president and he says appoints rfk to the uh, the hhs you know human uh secretary where he's you know uh, in charge of the healthcare system or the food system, even if he gets in place and they, and they say we're gonna we're gonna clamp down on this and that, that by itself, and that's still an, a big if, if that happens, is unlikely to be sweeping change. It's likely to be incremental things over many, many years, phased out over 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. And so don't depend on that as your salvation because it won't be, right? You know, we have food addiction, we have 70% of the population, I would argue, is addicted to crappy food, right? And why, if just cutting calories and eating more protein and working out was the answer, why do we have such a friggin' fat population? If that were the answer and it was so simple like that, the answer is because we're dealing with addiction on top of this, right? And how do you break addiction, you know? Do you tell an alcoholic, hey, just, you know, just moderate, have you got a few drinks here and there? Doesn't work, right? You know? And this is the thing, you know, people that go on a carnivore diet, and, and there are many tens upon tens of thousands, probably into the hundred thousands, perhaps you know, the millions at this point, are, I would say universally, but in significant ways, a hot, well, significant majority of them are saying, this is the first time I've been able to give up the stuff. I don't have cravings for the garbage anymore. I'm finally able to shut off the intrusive sort of thoughts about food. And that is significant. That is tremendously significant to the point that, you know, people are being demonized as being orthorexics or having an eating disorder because, oh, they won't indulge in their ho-hos and Twinkies and Doritos and ice cream here and there. You know, you wouldn't. can you imagine calling an alcoholic that doesn't drink anymore something wrong with them? Oh, this, what's wrong with you? Can't you have a little drink here and there? I mean, it's the same sort of deal here, guys. And so don't let anybody tell you that you're weird 
or that you are orthorexic or you have an eating disorder just because you refuse to eat crap anymore. And whether or not that crap is a Twinkie or for you in your particular metabolism, a bowl of spinach, it doesn't really matter. If it bothers you, if it makes you sick, then you need to avoid it. It's as simple as that. Um, I've said repeatedly, does everybody on the planet need to be on a carnivore diet? Absolutely not, right? I don't believe that. Uh, do I think it is a tremendously powerful tool? It is a tremendously powerful intervention for people with autoimmune disease, cardiometabolic disease, inflammatory disease, gut issues. And that number is not an insignificant tiny percentage of the population. That represents tens, if not hundreds of millions of people, and certainly worldwide. In the U.S., that's many tens, if not over 100 million people. You know, we have a you know, we have something like 100 million pre-diabetics and diabetics. We have another, you know, 20 to 50 million people with autoimmune diseases. You know, if we count arthritis and inflammatory disease and all things on top, that's that's a significant percent of the people. Probably all the 70% the, the that are overweight, obese, and addicted to food probably fall within that category. So anyway, just some thoughts. A little sweat here. Like I said, I was out of breath from the workout. Um, I will... Uh, I'm excited to get back rolling. I've got to go out of town again uh, to Ohio on the 12th. I'm speaking as a keynote speaker at a large veterinarian conference, which would be interesting in Columbus. Be there on the 12th. From there, I go back to Europe. I'll be in Slovakia, uh, the 20, gosh, I want to say around the 22nd, 23rd, speaking in Bratislava at a, at a, at a sort of a carnivore conference. Then I'm back in town and then I've got to go to New York to speak on the 5th of, uh, of October and, and on and on and on. So I've got a lot of stuff coming up. Anyway, guys, thanks for watching the channel. Thanks for supporting what I do. Uh, thanks for, more, more importantly, thanks for taking care of yourself. It's on you guys to fix the problem. Don't, de don't depend on our politicians. Don't depend on Trump, RFK, or anyone else that says they're going to reform the food system. You are what is in charge of what goes in your mouth, right? And what you feed your family. Remember that. Remember that. You know, all right, guys. <laughs> a little sweaty here. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.